little bit about the few a few of the important things in chapter one. Um, uh, chapter one is very introductory, and you can read it. Uh, but just I, I may I've got some of these for different chapters, so hopefully if you find them useful, please let me know. But um, anyway, we're going to talk about um, just why we have accounting. And, and I have this handout for you to print out. I would encourage you to fill it out as I go along so you can have sort of a study resource. But um, I think it's important to take the time to read the learning objectives. And when you get done, go back through the learning objectives and see if you can uh, verbalize those learning objectives to yourself to see if you've mastered them. I've also included some discussion questions on the handout. And the solutions for these are at the end, so I'm not going to go over those. But if you read through the solutions, it, they kind of help you prepare for the multiple choice part of the exam and also help you with um, identifying these learning objectives. So I'd encourage you to read the discussion questions and the solutions and, and see if you understand those. So we're basically going to talk about accounting. Hopefully this uh, chapter doesn't take very long. There are some. Um, pretty long chapters. But um, I think you all know that if we want to look at how well a person has done, we look at financial information, and that financial information is what we're going to be talking about in this class. Um, and so basically what that financial information does is help us make decisions. So um, our, the rules change occasionally because the economy changes and people have different ideas on what decisions they need to make. But basically, we need some sort of way to track our economic activities um, and to help us make decisions on those economic activities. Um, there are different types of accounting information. We're going to talk about in this class financial accounting. Financial accounting is important because it's for external users. So in class, I like to talk about we're going to get the second type is managerial accounting. I like to. Uh, relate financial accounting to um, athletics. So let's say that we have, um, I'll just make up a, a rowing team um, or some sort of ping pong team. We're gonna have table tennis team. Okay, so basically uh, financial accounting is like the game. So since in the games, if you're going to play table tennis or badminton, or if you're going to come up uh, across a new sport that's in the Olympics, everyone needs to know the rules. And so since everyone needs to know the rules, financial accounting is more like that. We have a prescribed set of rules that we follow so everyone knows the rules when they're coming in. So if you would uh, attend the, uh, the Olympics and play badminton or a collegiate basketball or volleyball, you would know the rules before you came in and everyone knows the rules. So that's for external users. And they're called general purpose because basically, uh, as uh, shareholders, we want information on a business. But the business doesn't want you calling up every day and asking how they did. So they're called general purpose because uh, decision makers, we formed an organization called the Financial Accounting Standards Board that sets some rules, have meet and get together and decide, okay, what is the rule we're going to follow? And similarly in athletics, um, the, the rule-making bodies meet and decide, okay, uh, what are we going to do this year? So um, every sport has rule changes. So when I was young, there was no such thing as a three-point line in basketball. But the external, or I'm sorry, the decision makers met and had a rule that everyone is going to follow. Um, notice that rule isn't, doesn't always benefit each team and their general purpose. So now I'm going to kind of move away from the sports analogy. You may want to know something specific about your firm. Um, your firm can provide that data, but basically um, we want our markets to be efficient also. So the rules are kind of standardized to try to meet most businesses, and therefore sometimes all the rules don't exactly, um, isn't, aren't a perfect rule for any business, but they're um, pretty good and they're standard for all businesses, so we don't spend tons of money uh, getting 
to make sure we show every single item that every person needs. So they need to be general purpose. It, not, not sometimes that's a shortfall. Okay. Um, so the second one is management accounting. And so I said financial accounting is like the sport itself where we need the rules. And so uh, another school is going to come and play the sport. They know the rules before they come. So if we're going to play basketball, they don't come to Quincy University and find that we play it outside and our hoop is basically um, down on the ground and your hoop is 50 feet in the air. Um, we know the rules ahead of time. However, I think if managerial accounting is more like practice. And, and in practice for sports, we can take a rule and then rule in basketball is we play five on five. But in practice, if we want to say, okay, we're going to play um, three on three, so we can hone something or we're going to play five on five, but today you can only shoot three point shots because we want to work on our three point shots. So management accounting is more like practice and it usually works around the financial statement rules, but you uh, won't often see a basketball practice use a football um, and try to shoot it through the hoop. So we use the same sort of standards and the framework is there with the standards, but we alter them to suit the needs we need internally. So for instance, in financial accounting, if you have um, GE owns NBC and there's lots of companies that own other companies, you can only get the financial information of the conglomerate, the whole company as a whole. But certainly internally, we might need the results of General Electric or we might need the results of um, NBC or something. So we break it apart as we need it or we may need the results for last week. So we kind of work with the financial data and tailor it to our needs. Tax accounting is its own creature in and of itself. Um, tax laws are not financial statement laws. Um, make sure um, you know that. A lot of people actually kind of get mixed up because they only um, prepare a tax return for themselves and so financial statement rules are different. Uh, but if you really think about it, tax is part of the federal government and the federal government's incentives are different than fair representation of the business that financial reporting would have. So for instance, in taxes, sometimes we decide um, we want you to buy, um, be more energy efficient. So we offer credits for insulating your home or we've decided that uh, we want to encourage you to buy more uh, goods, so we allow you more depreciation, and we allow you to depreciate all in one year, et cetera. So uh, taxes is tied in with fiscal and monetary policy and also fair policy. That's why we have standard deductions for people who don't earn a lot of money, et cetera. So the, the goal is different, whereas financial accounting, our goal is how did they do, and I want a fair representation of how they do. Taxes um, are more for equity or encouraging us to do something. So those are our types of accounting information. Um, here's the accounting process that we're going to take. So basically, when you go into a store and you buy something, how does that get into the accounting information? How does that get into the financial statement? So if I, you know, if you buy um, a drink on your way into work, that becomes accumulated with all the financial information and we prepare a financial statement for the company, let's say Starbucks, for the entire year, and then uh, decision makers make decisions based on that accounting information. The accounting systems basically is all those processes, and you can read through those. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the users and what do they do. Here's our accounting users. Investors, notice these are all external. So investors decide whether to buy the stock or sell the stock. Creditors loan money. Managers, um, are, these are internal. I shouldn't have said they're all external. Most of the first two are the big external users. Um, managers are internal. They would use it. Owners, customers, et cetera, et cetera. And here's some decisions that they make. So you can kind of read through those. The, the functions of accounting is basically when you need to interpret the transaction and then, okay, so the basic functions of accounting 
interpret class by summarize. So if I ask you for a report of how much you spent last week on food, entertainment, and gas, uh, you would go through your receipts and you would put them in three piles. And then you might um, list them all out and hand it to me and I would say, no, I don't care about the details. I want three lines on my report. One line called food with a dollar number after it, one line with gas and a dollar number after it, and one line with entertainment and a dollar. So we interpret it that it was indeed food or entertainment, gas, etc. And then we classify them and then we summarize it and communicate the information. So just it's a little more complicated in, in a business. These are kind of important components of internal control. Um, so I hope we get all of these in, in the following slides. But internal control are those processes in a business that make sure things are operating like we need it to operate. So the uh, control environment, we'll get skipped down here, can be locks on doors because we don't want things stolen. But we also want to make sure things are recorded correctly and those types of things. So the first component of internal control is the control environment. Sometimes we talk about the control environment as the tone of the top. How important is it in the organization um, that you follow these? So I think we've all had situations where you know that the boss or somebody doesn't feel it's important, so you don't feel it's important either. Um, and so that's the control environment. The next one is, um, and, and please read the details on the, these. There, there will be more questions, but I'm trying to just give you an overall assessment of those in a quick fashion. Um, risk assessment is identifying the risks. So businesses um, actually have a, a good area is enterprise risk management. And, and people and um, executive teams meet to identify the risks. So in a hospital environment right now, it is uh, privacy data, and I shouldn't even say hospital, all businesses right now. Uh, one risk that they have is, is privacy issues and how do we manage people's uh, social security numbers and identification numbers and those types of things. Um, but we also would look at the risks as far as what about the competition in the business environment? What about overseas competition? What are, how are tariffs impacting us, et cetera, et cetera. So it identify those risks um, and problems that may happen. We can also get into a risk assessment on the more nitty gritty level of, we have cash coming in, so that's high risk. And what are we going to do to make sure that cash? Um, another risk on a lower level would be, how do we uh, improper classification of transactions? So how do I make sure that I get the transactions classified properly? Or how do I get them to make sure they're entered correctly because I think we've all transposed numbers in our life. So how do I make sure people don't transpose numbers? So that's all part of the risk assessment. Control activities are those things that we do after we look at the risks to make sure that those risks are taken care of. So for example, if it's really important uh, and you don't want to transpose numbers, you could enter it twice or have two different people enter it twice. You can have doors locked. You can have approvals before you spend more than, you know, let's say in your own household. Um, you allow your children to uh, go out and buy $10 items, but anything over $10, they have to get approval from you. Um, separation of duties. Make sure that you have different people with, this is kind of important, you separate custody of the asset from record keeping from authorization. So you separate authorization, record keeping, and custody. So for example, if I collected the cash, I can take the cash. But pretty soon the person will get another bill that says they owe the business. And then they'll find out that, okay, they did pay them and somebody took the cash. And if I open the cash, that's me. But if I have record keeping responsibilities, um, I can take some cash and then when somebody else pays cash or cash comes in, I can apply it to the customer account. This is called lapping. And then uh, obviously that customer that paid me 
now has a bill outstanding, but I applied their cash to somebody else's account. But then when another cash comes in, I apply it to their account. And I keep lapping, and the new cash coming in is paid toward an, uh, is applied to another account. And I can do that because I have custody and record keeping responsibilities. Now give me authorization to write off accounts, and I can write off the account of the of a person that I stole money from. And so basically, if I have custody, I can steal. If I have custody and record keeping, I can steal and hide it. And I have custody, record keeping, and authorization, I can steal and hide it forever. So we want to make sure that custody, authorization, and record keeping are all separated. And there's lots of other duties we want to separate, but those are the important ones. And safeguarding of assets, that's um, keys, etc. So these are all the activities that we would put in place to minimize these risks. So if I said data privacy issues, we may have firewalls and we may have um, different uh, password change requirements and we may have double or triple level identification, etc. Information and communication. Um, basically, that is, is part of the internal control system because we need to have systems in place to make sure that we communicate that information. Um, and you can kind of read that. And then lastly, monitoring. I, I don't know that I consider it a basic function. Every textbook includes it, but monitoring is checking on the other functions. So what do we have to make sure that indeed we are um, making sure people have keys, et cetera, that nobody's propping open the door, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all monitoring it. So those are the important components of internal control. So read a little bit more about those. Some external users, this is usually for financial accounting. So up here, the types of accounting, financial, managerial, and tax, we're talking usually about uh, financial accounting. These are the people that use it. So. Some objectives of financial reporting. We want information about the economic resources or things we have. So if a business says land or buildings or subsidiaries, those are the economic resources they have. So you may have a car. That's your economic resources. Claims to those resources. Well, if you had to, if you bought a $30,000 car and owe the bank $25,000 of it, that's an important claim to that car that you have, and changes in those resources and claims. So if this year I have a car and I owed $25,000 on it, and next year I paid off $10,000 of that car, so now I only owe $15,000, that's a change to those resources and claims. Um, provide information that is useful in assessing the timing and uncertainty of future cash flows. This is the cash flow statement mainly, um, and it tells where cash is coming from. And lastly, provide information useful in making investment and credit decisions because we're external users as a focus of financial reporting. And so you can read through a little bit more in your book, but make sure you know all the details. I'm not telling you everything you need to know about this. I'm just kind of providing you with an introduction. Uh, the primary financial statements, balance sheet. The balance sheet, the important thing about that is it's as a specific date. So I'm, I'm going to draw here a second. So if you think of the the financial statements, let's pick a day today. Let's say I start a business today. I will do a balance sheet listing what I have. What I have is a car. Okay. What I have is a car and the bank owns a car worth $30,000. The bank owes, owns $25,000 of the car and I own $5,000. So here's my balance sheet. Here's what I have today and, and what I owe today. So if, think about your own personal life. What do you have today and what do you owe on it? That's the balance sheet. So that's today. Okay, I'm going to actually make it January 1st. Okay, and then what's going to happen is next January 1st, or more correctly, December 31st, I'm going to do another balance sheet that says, what do I have? So let's say I started a business that gives people rides. And so now I, I have a lot more cash in my bank account for my business because I, I had a business. So the, uh, 
do a balance sheet on a day. It's a snapshot of what I have. Then at the end of the year, I do a snapshot of what I have. And then what happens is the income statement and the cash flow statement tell the story of how you got from there to there. So what I'll have is I'll have beginning balance sheet, but let's pretend we've been in business, so let's go from here. How'd I get from day one to the end of the year? And then what do I have at the end of the year? And then I'm gonna do that for the next year. I'm gonna do the income statement and cash flow statement to show how I get to the next year. Well, I'll do another balance sheet. So this is your financial statements right here. You can look at last year's to get last year's balance sheet. And then again, I just keep going. The income statement and cash flow statement tell me how I got from, say I got from my balance sheet of this had $8,000 cash, and this balance sheet had $80,000 cash. So the question is, how in the world did I get from eight to $80,000? And you might find out that I had, I just borrowed money. Um, uh, and because I bought something, uh, or I'm going to buy something tomorrow. Whereas that's less impressive than if I got the 80, the growth from eight to eighty thousand dollars to seventy-two thousand dollars, because I had a great business scheme, etc. All right. So those are your financial statements. The two of the three, two of the four, but three primary. Statement of cash flows is just that. It details the cash flows um, over a period of time. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so characteristics of financial information is just basically to help make better decisions. So it's not perfect. Um, it's just to help us get there. Notice where we talk mainly about financial statements, but if you pull up a company, they have what's called an annual report that includes a letter from the president, it includes background information on their products, et cetera, et cetera. We're just going to mainly talk about the financial statements in this class. Okay, notice it's also historical in nature because we like to double check it. Um, it's verifiable and accurate of what happened in the past, and, and we leave that up to um, the shareholders to read the news, et cetera, or the president's letter to tell them what's going on. But uh, in financial statements, we take care of the past. You can't book a sale in the future, so we talked about. It uses, we're going to make some guesstimates in here. So, for example, if I said, you have a $50,000 car that's going to last you five years. Most of us would say, okay, it makes sense to spread that $50,000 over the five years and have an expense of $10,000 each year on that car. Okay, um, but how do you know it's five years? You guessed. Okay, so we have some inexact and approximate measures here. There are some inherent limitations of accounting information. We can't book everything. Uh, one important thing that we can't book is the value of people. The value of people is in their salary, but I think we can all agree that um, not everybody gets paid the same. I think if you look up uh, the gender difference, uh, females make 80% of what men make, and I don't think it, uh, in every situation that um, the salary necessarily dictates what a person is worth to the business. Um, however, let's even take that personally. Um, I know that some, some months, some days, I probably am a more valuable employee than on other days. And maybe on some days I should, if somebody wanted to take my real worth, I should be paid more, and some days I should be paid less. So we don't value people in a business um, it's just too hard. So the salary is an approximation of what they're worth, but we don't put them on the business as an asset. So think of it this way. Uh, what would happen to Microsoft if Bill Gates died? Right after um, Steve Jobs died, everyone was really wondering what was going to happen to Apple uh, because he was so important to the firm. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty, but they're valued at 
nothing on the financial statements. There's not a line that says value of the president or CEO of the, of the business. Okay, and then we've talked about the general purpose assumption. It's not necessarily tailored to a specific user. So we have overall rules that are kind of broad guidelines for everyone to follow, and so they're not perfect. Um, and, and then there's lots of other things that are um, part of the financial reports that aren't part of the financial statements that help you. Okay, internal users of financial information. This is kind of gets under this one, the difference. Um, internal users have more specific needs, so you can see that the plant managers might want more detailed information on a product or a division, etc. Simple organizational chart. Um, so really accounting is tailored um, to help management make the decision. So sometimes there is a financial accounting rule that we won't follow for managerial accounting because it, it doesn't necessarily provide us with the information that we need. So for example, one that comes to mind is financial accounting says for research and development costs, she would expense it in the year. So if I spent um, several million dollars on research and development this year, I would have an expense on my income statement for several million dollars. But uh, internally, you might want to say, okay, well that research and development is going to benefit me for the next three years so I want to spread the cost over three years because I'm going to be able to sell that product over three years. So again management accounting we can tweak towards our needs. So you can kind of read through these and not really have anything to add that's not really said or in your book. Um, integrity um, I'm going to kind of jump to this where I, they talk about it later in here. But I'm going to just tell you a little story about um, accounting. But um, there used to be a firm named Arthur Anderson. Um, there are four to five, maybe six, but really four big accounting firms. And at the time Arthur Anderson was there, um, they, I think they were down to the big five. There's been some consolidations and mergers. Okay, but Arthur Anderson was the biggest of the big. Okay, so if you have a um, visualize a sports team, visualize a company, and um, these firms, these big four firms of all the accountant accounting firms in the world, um, these were worldwide firms, and Arthur Anderson was the biggest of the big. So everybody knew Arthur Anderson. So think about Walmart or Amazon might pop into your mind as big companies. Um, Arthur Anderson was the firm that was associated with auditing Enron, quickly followed by WorldCom. In a matter of three months, Arthur Anderson went from the biggest auditing and accounting firm in the world to out of business because people could not trust the information that they gave. So. Accounting information for ethics and accountants and accounting information, if you can't trust it, there's no need to have it. Nobody would want it and we'd be out of a job. So it's pretty important for accounting information to be correct. Um, so you can kind of read through these. So um, here's some certain things that you need to know. Um, make sure you know I don't have this on the handout, but this is important. We call the rules in financial accounting general accepted accounting principles. So again, think of financial accounting as the sport. So if you're going to play collegiate, um, last year I had I asked the students which which sport had a rule change that year, and and soccer. One of the soccer girls said, yeah, the, they had a rule change in, in regarding the use of your head. I, I can't. I think they can still use a head. I can't remember exactly what it is. But concussion protocol. So um, as of then, everybody has to follow that concussion protocol. Um, it used to be many years ago you could watch football and not see and see players not wearing helmets. That that doesn't take place anymore. Um, there used to be no three point line, etc. So generally accepted accounting principles principles are the rules financial accounting follows. 
It does change over time. There is no gap one, gap two, gap three. It is generally accepted. The Financial Accounting Standards Board is the current rulemaking body, but gap comes from several sources, not just there. Um, Securities and Exchange Commission. The Securities and Exchange Commission was came into being after the stock market crash, and so we had the Securities and Exchange Act, uh, Securities Act of 33, and the Securities and Exchange Act of 34. Um, it was put in place by Congress to regulate the financial markets. So basically, Congress said, SEC, you need to create accounting rules. Well, the SEC looked around and the, well, the, they identified that the problem wasn't that there were no accounting rules, but that there was no enforcement of the accounting rules. So the SEC was put in, established by Congress to set the accounting rules, but they <coughs> has the legal power to establish accounting principles, but they don't do it. They allow the FASB to do it. So basically they de delegate the, um, authority to the FASB, and they are kind of the law enforcement of it. Okay, um, this is discussed on the next slide. I'm not sure that it was discussed. Um, the FASB is the current rulemaking body. Oh, I see. That's the rulemaking body that sets the rules. So the SEC allows the FASB to set the rules. It is the most authoritative source of GAAP, but not the only authoritative source of GAAP. The International Accounting Standards Board, uh, we currently don't follow international accounting standards, although the FASB does look at all the rules and we're trying to do what's called convergence uh, and have uh, similar rules when we can. Uh, this is an important body. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board was created in 2002 after Enron and WorldCom and the Arthur Anderson scandal that I just talked to you about. Um, so while the SEC was put in place by Congress to oversee financial reporting, the PCAOB was put in place by Congress to um, oversee auditing or the accounting profession. So they focus on audits. Audits, um, we talked about that. Audits have to be conducted by a CPA. So it's, a, it's just a double check of the financial statements. So we don't look at everything, but we do test to make sure they're reliable and um, materially correct. Okay, so we talked about Sarbanes-Oxley, etc. The AICPA is a professional organization that's a membership body of accountants and it also provides uh, research um, and interpretations on some of the financial accounting standards. Institute of Management Accountants is um, just that, management accounting organizational body and they offer the certified management CMA designation. So the CPA designation is is <coughs> um, set in place by the American Institute of CPAs and the CMA designation certified management accounting is for the um, from the IMA. There's also um, and I'm I'm a CMA and a CPA. I'm not an in, I'm not an internal auditor, but there's also an institute of internal auditors and you can kind of read through what they do. American Accounting Association is an accounting educator society. Um, the COSO, the Concert Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, um, this is really what you should probably know here, that they are developing standards for internal control, the control environment thing that we talked about. And hopefully that you know that accountants need to be competent. You want your numbers right. Um, and you can kind of read through those. So this tells a little bit about a CPA and a CMA. You can kind of read through those. So, and we talked about um, different reasons why ethics is important. So hopefully you read it. Closely make some notes um, and enjoy the chapter and semester. <laughs>